when does this uh... shalom welcome to the jewish view my name is rabbi nachman simon with the chabad house of delmar and together with my co-host mark rohn at just statewide news service jbiztechvilly.com and as you can see now Columnist for the Jewish Press. Yep, I'm having a lot of fun doing all of that, and uh, I write a column about how government relates to the Jewish community, or doesn't, as the case may be. And speaking of government, uh, we do have the uh, top law enforcement uh, guy in Rensselaer County. Uh, Joel Avalov is the newly elected Rensselaer County District Attorney. Welcome to the Jewish View. Thank you very much. And you're also the first Jewish elected district attorney in <laughs> Rensselaer County. Well, it's funny because uh, <laughs> most people don't recognize my name as being Jewish, yeah. so I tell them my name is Joel Abelov, and they say, oh, I didn't know you were Jewish. You know, or afterwards. you say lots of love. You know, you <laughs> focus on the love part. Yeah. It's <laughs> interesting, you know, as being a lawyer, obviously you can go into so many different fields, and uh, if it's a prosecution, I mean, why right. did you want to go and say, you know, there's so many Jewish defense attorneys, and like sure. you said, you're the first uh, Rensselaer County Well, I'll tell you, it's a, that's a great question because my father's an attorney and his father was an attorney. My father's been practicing almost 51 years, wow. and uh, it's just something that's always been in my blood. I uh, interned in a couple of DA's offices while I was a law school student here at Albany Law School. I interned in, in the Albany County DA's office for two semesters. Under Saul Greenberg? Uh, under Saul Greenberg, and then I interned in the Rensselaer County District Attorney's Office my last semester of law school for then District Attorney Mary Donahue. And when I graduated, I took the bar exam and, uh, and passed. I actually landed the job in the DA's office the same day that I found out I passed the bar exam. It was a stroke of, of great timing uh, for me. And uh, I spent a little over 10 years there as an assistant district attorney. And then I left and I became a prosecutor at the New York State Department of Health, prosecuting physician misconduct under the public health law. Fraud. Uh, yeah, the, lots, there's lots of different ways that physicians can commit misconduct, yeah. actually. Fraud is one of them. Uh, and then I was there for a little over nine years, and then I got elected in 2014, and I'm about a year and three months into my my oh, first four-year term. I don't. I, when people are first elected, I don't have them on the show for at least six months into their job because I want them to get. I don't want them to come on the show and say, "Well, I don't know yet." Right. You know. So I let some time go by so that they know. So I'm glad that you know we found the time for you to be. I'm here. happy to come in. And. Uh, you have a lot of different, I went on the website, uh, and, and your website is not separate from the county. No, it's so, not, and that's something. And it's not really that explicit in terms of what you do, I and mean, you could do a lot more if you only had the Rensselaer right. DA.org website. Well, we're working on that. that. Historically, all the departments in the county have been part of an overall right. county website, and we've just been recently given some administrative rights to work on the website and, and put things on there that'll make it a lot more user-friendly and a lot more informative, frankly, for the public to know and understand what it is that we do in the office. So I did find out that you do have certain departments and certain, you know, like your divide, your, how many DA, is ADAs do you have? Well, we're down a few positions right now. There's always turnover in a DA's office, uh, yeah. regrettably, but uh, when we are all full, there's myself, my chief assistant, and there will be about 15 other attorneys in the office. I think we're at about 12 right now, okay. uh, which is a lot more than when I started. There were only eight assistant district attorneys. There's more crime? Why do you? <laughs> I mean, why? I mean, Big there's budget. more money. Yeah. I mean, yeah, bigger budget. I well, mean, uh, there, there, there's certainly several reasons why we were able to expand the office over the years. Part of it is increased funding. Some of it obtained through grants so that it's not a, a out of the direct tax levy to the county. Um, and a lot of that is because of need. Uh, there are more crimes on the books. There's a lot more drug-driven crime, I would argue, right now. Uh, there's, so cer there, there's certainly, um, uh, there are more courts that we have to cover. When I started, there was only one county court judge. Now there are two county court judges, plus we have some integrated domestic violence courts. We have drug treatment courts. Mm -hmm. These are all courts that have to be staffed by people. Right. Uh, so that allows us to, uh, to go back to the folks and say, we, we need some more people. You know, going back to what you say about drugs, because, you know, Mark and I have so many government officials on, and we have a lot of DAs, and underlining, they always say drugs is the major, you know, I say, what's the major crime, and they're always saying drugs. Heroin. Heroin. Well, it's, it's certainly, I think, the major crime driver, whether it's a, a drug offense in and of itself or an offense related to the underlying problem of drugs. We see so many burglaries and robberies and larcenies and assaults homicides sometimes that are that all have this common thread of drug use 
uh, running through it that if you, I'm sure if you talk to our sheriff and look at our statistics of who's incarcerated down at the Rensselaer County Jail, an overwhelming number of defendants who are incarcerated there are there for drugs or drug-related crime. Yeah, well, and sometimes sure. it's the usual suspects. I mean, sometimes they, you know, you could go through and see, I mean, one person told us about three generations <coughs> of family members were in the jail at one time. I think it was the Albany County Jail. Well, and yeah, it's not uncommon to, to have certainly repeat offenders. We see a lot of the same names over and over again. You know, and people are, you know, in the county jail, I was told that they're preparing for their next crime while they're serving time because they like three cots in a cot. So they really do see, well, when I get out, now mm -hmm. what do I want to, you know, because there's a structure in the jail. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to do certain things at a certain time, certain, you know, you go out to the yard, you have to eat a certain time, you have to get up a certain time, lights right. out a certain time, and they like that structure. When they get out into society, there's no structure for them. Well, that's certainly true, I think, for some defendants. I mean, historically, we would see some people who would uh, willingly commit crimes as they were going into the winter season so that they can get out of the cold mm -hmm. and, and get housing and three really meals. Uh, yeah. It is a shame. Um, but other people, I, I don't know if they're uh, strategically plotting it as they sit in there in order to make sure they get three right. meals. I, I think there are many people who we encounter who just uh, don't seem to know another way of life mm -hmm. uh, but to get into trouble and commit crimes and, and make really bad choices. Some of the people uh, are suffering from addictions and are driven to their crimes because of their addiction. They're still responsible for what they do. Um, but, you know, when you mentioned the heroin ep epidemic, I just last week attended uh, a forum that Rensselaer County just started putting together with the county executive and the sheriff and myself and uh, our commissioners of, of mental health and the health department to start having a community conversation about the scourge of this epidemic. And it is absolutely horrific. The amount of heroin in our communities, and Rensselaer County is certainly not alone in this regard, the amount of heroin in our communities is staggering. And it's not in the inner cities solely anymore. It's out in the county. Uh, Averill Park was featured in Cosmopolitan Magazine for all the wrong reasons because they had such an inordinately high number wow. of overdose fatalities. Uh, there's really not a day that goes by that I don't see police reports about people overdosing somewhere in the county. Sometimes they live, sometimes they don't, and it, it's uh, do a think, function of, of a number of, of factors that really need to be addressed by do society. Do you think Narcan is a good thing? Or, I mean, well, sure. I mean, it, it's a good thing in that it can save somebody's life from an overdose. It doesn't address the underlying addiction. Uh, it doesn't help get somebody off of a drug. Uh, it, it's a life-saving measure that is critical and has saved a number of lives. Unfortunately, a lot of those people who are addicts go right back to using it after their life has been saved, and some of them may overdose again. You know, we had someone on the show who said that Narcan is really uh, something that they wouldn't, that they don't like because it sort of perpetuates someone's life when they want, they really want to die. Then it just mm -hmm. kind of perpetuates their life and it, they're more of a burden on society and social services. And if, you know, they, you know, and that was a hard, yeah, end, you know. I'm, uh, I'm not sure I agree with that. I don't, yeah. I don't know that there are heroin addicts who are taking the drug because they're trying to commit suicide. I think they may inadvertently overdose on it because you don't always know the quality of what you're getting on the street. Right. Um, you know, it's, there, there's a variety of reasons why something that you're taking willingly can result in an unintended overdose. I don't know that it means that the person's trying to end their life. Uh, I don't see Narcan as a bad thing at all. I think we should try to save people's lives uh, because life is precious. Is there any way besides, I mean, education is probably the number one idea. I mean, people just don't even know what they're getting into, I think. You know, or, you know, kids saying, oh, it's cute, Absolutely. it's nice, or something like that. Right. But, I mean, and you're not the sheriff. You're not, you know, once you see them prosecutors. Is there any way to stop the... <coughs> influx of this heroin? I mean, I know that's not your job. I mean, it's... Well, the influx is another story. I mean, certainly there's a demand that's created which perpetuates the volume that comes in. But um, from what I know from the, the sources I, I speak with in law enforcement, uh, at conferences that I attend, the bulk of the heroin that comes in to this country right now is coming through Mexico. Mm -hmm. It used to come in more from Afghanistan, but it's farther and economics plays in, into it when it, if you have to ship something mm -hmm. farther it costs more and you can ship it a shorter distance from Mexico and make more money. Well now that they got El Chapo maybe <coughs> they won't be uh, as much of a... <laughs> well, probably wishful thinking. Uh, there's, 
there's a tremendous amount of heroin that's coming in and the purity of this heroin is greater than it has been in the past and it's coming in at such volume that it's market economics it's cheaper and it's more potent which results in greater number of people being it's addicted and, and, and overdoses. It's probably because they want people to get addicted? Is there a nefarious idea well, I th behind that? I, I think perhaps just the quality of what they're growing and, and manufacturing is, mm -hmm. is a higher potency uh, and, and purity level, if you will. Is it that, made that, from heroin? It's made from poppy seeds. Poppies. It's the opium, right. So uh, I served in Afghanistan. That certainly was an mm -hmm. issue um, overseas and continues to be with the poppy fields that are in Afghanistan. But that's not the only place it's grown. And you can go to Mexico and they're, they're manufacturing so much of this heroin and they're just flooding it across our, our southern border, which uh, unfortunately, as everybody knows from the news, is yeah. incredibly porous. And it's, uh, when you're talking that kind of money, people are going to find a way to try well, to get I, it in I the country. I heard that they put up 4,000 cameras. They used to have 10 cameras. Now they've got like 4,000 mm -hmm. cameras along the border. But uh, Donald Trump wants to build this wall and have Mexico pay for it. So do you... See, you know, do you see any of those as a good solution, whether it's cameras or a wall? Uh, well, absolutely. I think it's a combination of things. Israel built a wall, and it seems to be working pretty well. Um, I don't see why we can't build a wall or fencing or what have you. It's already, uh, people are talking about this like it's an idea that he came up with, Donald <laughs> Trump. The wall has already been passed into law in this country. Right. The Congress just hasn't funded it and, and built it. But it, it has already been voted on by the people in this country, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just a matter of getting it built right. and funding it. And certainly that's one measure uh, to be able to slow down or stop the influx of not only illegal drugs, but uh, illegal aliens, criminals coming across the border, right. terrorists coming across the border. Absolutely. So, so about other crimes? What about legalizing marijuana? That's always a big issue. And, um, you know, I, I, my congregation is more traditional, to say the least. Mm -hmm. But in that sense, um, they're very liberal and, oh, yes, we'll make so much money. A billion dollars will come in if you, mm -hmm. you know, you like that, the prohibition with the alcohol. You couldn't stop it. <coughs> you might as well make money on it from taxes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just totally against it because, I mean, I say I have ten jobs and one is, you know, visiting people in the prison. So, I, you know, my heart breaks for these people. And, right. you know, like I say, they can't help themselves. It's terrible. But, you know, so I see maybe the downside. People say, oh, it's marijuana. It's, it's, they're having a lot of fun. And I see what it does eventually to people. Right. But um, so uh, what would you be? Recreational use of marijuana, what's your view on that? I'm not for recreational use of marijuana. I don't think it's a good thing. I don't think it's a harmless drug at all. I think it is addictive. I think it's definitely a gateway for some people. Uh, I think the scientific evidence is there as to the, the long-term effects it has on the human body and the brain. And I, I look at it like this. If I wouldn't give it to my kids, if I wouldn't approve of my kids using this, why should I approve of anybody else using it? I think it's harmful. I think it's dangerous. Uh, and medical marijuana, that's controlled? That's something it is. That's something that just started yeah. in New York State, and it's not in a form that can be smoked. It's right. very uh, well controlled. and. The criteria for qualifying to get med medical marijuana is, so is, you like is the, pretty stringent. What was set up and what was passed into law, you think that was all good? Well, I think the process that they put into place and the, yeah. the structures to be able to ensure that people aren't getting it under false pretenses right. unnecessarily is absolutely a good okay. thing. Uh, how many bureaus or units do you have within your office? And did you change anything from your predecessor? Well, it's funny because when I first started there, we, we didn't have bureaus per se, and then I remember when they got instituted, as we got more people, I mean, at some point, it's, it's tough to have a bureau of one or two people when you get to a, a relatively small office. Bureaus become, uh, having a bureau becomes a relative term. Well, like we, I'm, I'm we, the capital we, bureau chief for the Jewish press, but I'm a bureau <laughs> chief of one, right. so I understand right. this could be. Well, we have one person title. who, who uh, <laughs> handles our appeals. We have uh, a drug unit, felony drug unit, felony DWI unit. We have our special victims unit, of which I was a bureau chief for a number of years when I used to be in, in the office you as an SVU? assistant DA. I yeah. did that for many yeah. years. And uh, then we have our major crimes bureau, and that's everything else that doesn't fall into the other bureaus, things like robberies, burglaries, assaults, right. larcenies. And that's, so, so you have uh, basically five bureaus? Essentially. Okay. First of all, now, I didn't know that you were head of the SVU. I asked this of, the, of your counterpart in Brooklyn. I went to uh, the Brooklyn DA takes his staff around to different neighborhoods in Brooklyn and mm -hmm. showcases them. And believe me, it's a long line of 
bureau chiefs uh, sitting at a table. Yeah. Um, well, Brooklyn's uh, a big city. Well, the, well, but it's like this is a whole list of all his uh, bureaus and divisions. Well, so. sure. well, they've got hundreds of attorneys in their <laughs> one office. Uh, exactly. So I asked them the show Law and Order SVU, mm -hmm. the TV show, is that close to reality? And the woman who heads up the SVU unit in Kings County said, yes, it's very close, except that, you know, the time frame is contracted. But, you know, as far as the, the, the way they mm -hmm. investigate and, you know, work with um, law enforcement and all that, mm -hmm. I mean, she says that. Well, maybe from her perspective close. in New York City, since that <clears throat> television show, take, show takes right. place in New York City, that's a little more reflective of how that operates in New York City. I would say that's a lot less reflective of the way it works in upstate New York, in a smaller office and with smaller police departments. Because they do bring the show upstate. They, they bring uh, it up to occasionally they do, Fulton but, but you got to understand they they only deal with one police department in New York City. Right. No matter which bureau they're in, they're dealing with the New York City Police Department. Right. You come to Rensselaer County, and we're dealing with about nine law enforcement agencies between the city police departments, the town and village police departments, the state police, the sheriff's office. So you're automatically going to have a different dynamic when you're talking about dealing with multiple law enforcement agencies okay. as opposed to having the consistency of dealing with one law enforcement uh -huh. agency. Um, you know, a, aside from that, the, the, the expectations I think that the television shows in that vein tend to create for people in society are wholly unrealistic. Not only because of the time frames involved, yeah. the compressed time frames that television necessitates, right. but also the, the nature of evidence that they seem to always be able to get on television uh -huh. which doesn't exist in real life or certainly it, you know, takes a lot longer to try to process evidence. Right. And, and we can laugh about those differences, but they have very real consequences right. when we pick juries and we have people come in to listen to cases because a lot of their expectations are based upon what they see on television. And I've talked to many jurors who say, well, aren't you able to test for this? Or how come you can't find out that? And I say, I'm sorry, that's only on television. It's, you're not going to find well, this that. This is here. why I bring it up, and because it's not so far afield from the average person. I sat through jury selection at Shelley Silver's trial okay. and other, you know, other things, other uh, cases also. But I just find it, you know, that voir dire process very interesting. Right. They and never show you that on Law and Order, do they? Once in a while, <laughs> if they have to, you know, yeah. focus on that. But right. yeah, otherwise. But I just uh, had this, uh, you know, the, you're dealing with different law enforcement agencies. And some are more cooperative than others, I presume. Well, it's not, it, it's not I wouldn't use the word <coughs> cooperative. They're all very cooperative. I think we've got some outstanding law enforcement in Rensselaer County amongst all the agencies. Yeah. But you'll have different levels of experience. Right. You'll have different capabilities depending on the size of the department sure. and their ability to just personnel-wise perhaps work on a bigger case. And sometimes they'll call in a, a larger agency like the state police if they need additional course, assistance. Yeah. Um, the, the, the lab that we use is the New York State Police Forensic, Forensic Investigation okay. Center. Obviously, in New York City, they have their own crime lab. Right. So we compete with other counties who all submit our evidence to the same lab up here, and you have to wait for, for and, results and to come And you in. see that the uh, cooperation between the prosecutors and the medical examiner's office uh, is very close. And right. I don't think that you can walk over or drive over to state police and have a face-to-face -face conversation with the... Well, actually, that's yeah. one area you'd be surprised because the, the medical examiner's office is different from the state police crime lab. We have mm -hmm. one medical examiner for Rensselaer County, which okay. is, you know, th and that's another thing in, in these law and order shows, there are lots of medical examiners down there, but they always end up dealing with the yeah. same the same person. Right. And I'm sure in real life that never happens because okay. they've got too many people to deal with. So right. one of the benefits of being in a smaller county where we are is that we typically deal with the same medical examiner. And I attend the autopsies on mm -hmm. homicides. We can talk to him. We've got a very good relationship. I've known him for years. And he works very, very well with our office. What's so his name? his name is Dr. Michael Sikorica. Sikorica. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And he, he's a fantastic uh, forensic pathologist. Uh, and, uh, you know, we can call him and get him over to our, our courthouse to testify, to prepare him to testify. Probably a lot easier, I would argue, than. Uh, in some of these larger counties, especially in New York City, where they have to find out who that medical examiner is who they're dealing with. They have so many more auto autopsies to deal when with. When I, you know, when I look at the Kings County District Attorney's Office, and I, I just look at this and I say, how do you deal with any of this? Maybe there's something that you don't, uh, that doesn't come across in Rensselaer County, that come across in 
sure. that they have a Civil Rights Bureau and Hate Crimes Unit. Right. You know, a Conviction Review Unit. A crime Strategies well, Unit. Brooklyn is an incredible city. But, it's but, a, it would be a major city. But I'm just wondering which right. ones of these don't pertain to Rensselaer County. I mm -hmm. mean, you would look at some of these bureaus and you would say, I mean, I'm going to ask every DA this, you know, it's mm -hmm. not the only one. Uh, elder Abuse Unit. I'm sure there's Elder Abuse in Rensselaer County. It's just mm -hmm. not Kings County. Forensic Science Unit. you got the Special Victim Unit. Human Trafficking uh, Unit. I mean, you have human trafficking, or it's not we, a... We, we've had one or two issue? cases, and That's what we it. typically do, we'll fold mm -hmm. a lot of those areas into maybe a Special Victims Unit if we have an Elder Abuse case. Uh -huh. So that would be handled by our SVU. Okay. Um, you know, and the other thing is, I could create all the, all the units in the world if I had the resources. Right. If somebody wants to give me 400 attorneys like they have down in, yeah, in just yeah. one of these counties... And I'm not meaning for that, you to sound... You know, no, no, I'm, way, I'm just saying I'm it's... Just, it's I'm just it's, looking, I, I, I yeah. just wanted to know, like you just said, Elder Abuse unit would sure. go into SVU. Correct. So you have a way of contracting. A absolutely. We handle those cases well. when they come in and we just have the attorneys who are in the office do it, whether you call it an elder abuse unit or your right. special victims unit. Even if you had no units and you just had ADAs handling various cases, the cases yeah. are going to get handled. It just, uh, you know, the, the, the names of units are just a means of organizing within your office. That's right. That's why That's I all. wasn't sure. Now, from your predecessor, ha you know, I forgot it. Who was your predecessor? Well, my immediate yeah, predecessor immediate. was Art Glass, Arthur Glass. He's, he was the acting district oh. attorney in 2014. He took over when uh, Richard McNally okay. left and became a Supreme Court justice. Okay, so under McNally's bureau, uh, DA's office, how did you change things from the way he did business? Oh, there are a lot of changes that have been made since we came in. Um, I would argue that, that there, and, and I'm not trying to disparage any, any previous uh, district attorney, but... Um, it's an objective statement. I'm just sure. asking, you know, without having to get into subtext. Sure. You know, no, I, I think we take a lot closer look at a lot of cases. I think we do a, a lot more analysis of these cases and take a stronger uh, position with respect to some offers that we make. Um, we've uh, instituted some guidelines for misdemeanor DWIs to gain some consistency throughout the county and the different courts. I mentioned we've got all these local courts that we have to staff. There are 18 city, town, and village courts in Rensselaer County that are just for the misdemeanor and, and below mm -hmm. level offenses. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, physical structural things we've done in the office yeah, that's what I was as well. We, we must have cleaned out 50 boxes worth of junk paper that had been lying around for years in the office. Uh, we got a new backup server that was needed. We put an air conditioner in that room to keep it from failing again. I mean, there's just, just lots of little things structurally yeah. to shore up the office and, uh, and to try to make it a much more professional uh, place to, to work and get the job done. Well, I th you've been praised consistently over the uh, short time that you've been district attorney about how professional your office is. Well, thank you. I appreciate and hearing I've that. Heard that throughout the capital district so thank you I just thought I'd mention that well to you. I appreciate that and if it's uh, if it if that's the perception people have I'm glad but yeah. it's uh, it's really do reality also it, it's, it's not perception well I like to think it's the reality yeah. we, we believe it is from our standpoint I hope that's the perception that people get because we certainly try to pro project that professionalism and it's only because the staff is doing such a wonderful job how much do you uh, have to be uh, out front on these cases as opposed to letting your ADAs be out front. They, you as the elected official, right. you have to show the voters certain things and you have to be sure. you know, out there. So, you know, is, I, I, I ask this of every district attorney because I never know when their chief assistant, you know, makes uh, mm -hmm. a statement in front of the cameras or the DA, the elected official, makes the statement. Right. You know, how do you handle... I, I generally <coughs> handle all the media. Um, I, that's why I'm on your show. I was well, on uh, the radio show last else. week. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say I, I have absolutely no problem answering questions. We've had press conferences with the law enforcement right. agencies. But when there's a case, and after the case is resolved, right. you come before the cameras. Right. I'm the one generally who does that in my office, not the ADAs. And that's a policy. That's a firm policy. Well, pretty much. I mean, I, I, every press release that goes out, I make sure the assistant DA's name is on that, who handled the case. Very often the, the press doesn't give them the credit and put their name in there. I wish they would because I remember when I was an assistant DA working very hard on all these cases and, and, and toiling on them that having that recognition publicly is, is nice for them because they put so much work into it. 
I always make sure that I mention who it is uh, who worked mm -hmm. on the case as well as the law enforcement because they're the ones doing all the grunt work on it. Well, even the Attorney General, I mean, he lists all the, uh, everyone in the effort at the last, the bottom paragraph. Is, right. Oh, also in this case is that, right. that, 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 you know. So. I mean, my job is to, is <laughs> to, to give my staff the, the resources, the structure, right. the guidance and the vision, the tools to get the job done. And they're the ones who have to go and execute that, that mission. Um, I am handling a number of cases personally. There's some high-profile homicides uh, that I've taken on, but so the, 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 the bulk of the work is certainly done by the staff. But you do get into the courtroom. You're not. Uh, I do. Okay. I now, do. what about this issue of raise the age? Could well, you tell me uh, what your feelings are and sure. maybe what your view of that issue is. Absolutely. Uh, as you may or may know, the governor had had raised that issue last year for the first time. Uh, and it, it did not make it into, uh, into law. This year he put it into his budget. Uh, we're anxiously awaiting the, uh, the budget mm -hmm. release no, shortly. I, 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 don't, I don't think that's going to be in there this year. <clears throat> um, but this is an issue that the DA's Association of the State of New York, of which I, obviously I'm a member, we've debated this very, very strenuously. Um, I don't believe that the raise the age legislation in the form that it's been proposed by the governor is is necessary. We have provided the governor's office as well as the legislature the statistical information to show mm -hmm. that a very, very small percentage of juvenile offenders, uh, these 16 and 17 year olds that they're talking about decriminalizing and sending into family court, maybe 5% of them end up in, with criminal convictions uh, at all mm -hmm. uh, because of the protections that we already have in place for people who are that young. So if there's a perception out there among some people that, and, and this has sort of been the impetus for this raise the age legislation to be proposed. If, if people think, well, 16 and 17 year olds are getting these criminal histories and they're going to jail in great numbers, it's just simply not true. Um, the DA's association has proposed its own legislation uh -huh. to try to help the legislature and the governor accomplish what it is that they're saying they're they're seeking Who's carrying with, with, without doing that. I don't think that anybody is carrying the bill. It's just something that we've offered as an alternative. As an alternative. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't and, believe and anybody's so taking it up. I didn't know. I thought the DA's association didn't take a position on the governor's plan. I thought they stayed neutral. But I'm, no, no, no. They, we, they opposed it. We opposed it in its current form uh, and, and proposed an alternative that we think is a, is a better working model to achieve what it is that everybody wants to address without a lot of the, the potential downsides because there's so many orders of effects to, to budgetary wise, structural wise, accountability wise <clears throat> that uh, we, we don't think that the, the, the bill in its current form so is going to. So in a brief time, can you explain the DA's position, what, the, what that bill? It's, it's actually very complicated and involved. Yeah. So in a brief time, I probably, okay. probably wouldn't be able to. What would be the highlight of the difference between what the DA say and what the governor says that you might want to point Sure. Out? Well, one of the, the main tenets that the, the governor's bill has in it has to do with automatically taking certain categories of offenses for those 16 and 17 year olds and having them diverted to family court or having a probation officer make an initial analysis mm -hmm. as to whether or not the case should go to family court or not even go there at all without the ability of the district, the elected district attorney to weigh in on that matter and influence the decision as to whether it should be prosecuted criminally in adult criminal courts. In New York State, when you turn 16, you become an adult in the criminal justice system. So that, that's a big difference that uh, we think is something that should be addressed because you've got potentially some, some serious crimes that could never see the inside of a criminal courtroom that should. You know, with one minute to go, I know we're almost out of time, but something yeah. that you're a volunteer with, Mr. Avlov, is the, uh, with, which was our mutual friend who passed away, Richard Hamel. And yes. I'd like you to talk about it, just a shout out to tell you know, sure. the people that, you know, like you say, we want to know what about the DA's office, but there's right. some, some very worthy organizations out there. Absolutely. Well, for years I've been involved with the Start Children's Center, and it's the Sexual Trauma and Abuse Recovery Team in Rensselaer County. I started working with them when I started interning in the DA's office there in the fall of 1994. They're a tremendous organization. They work with children who've been physically and or sexually abused as well as their non-offending family members. They provide counseling, referral services. Um, they, they case conference 
uh, different cases that are pending, not only in, in criminal court, but also in family court. And uh, being in the DA's office for years and working those special victims cases, I was very involved with them. When I left the DA's office, I joined their board of directors. Dr. Hamill was the, uh, the president of the board. I became the president of their board uh, when uh, Richard asked me to take over when he became ill, unfortunately. And um, I, I'm still involved with them in so much as our office is constantly working with the Star Children's Center, which is located in Troy, uh, to work with the, uh, the victims that we share, that they're, they're counseling and treating, and that we have in our cases. So the group has a sympathetic voice in the DA's office. Absolutely. I've seen for years the wonderful work that they do and how they, they help our cases by giving these children a, a child-friendly atmosphere to come and disclose things that have happened to them and get counseling and to support them and their families is, is a goal that we share to try to make these victims whole again. Thank you. That's thank you very much the for show, the, yeah. uh, on thank the you, Jewish Rabbi. view. I appreciate it. Thank Continue you. good success with, with your DAs and also thank with you. all your volunteer work. Thanks. And um, we'll see you with good success, with good mm -hmm. health. Yes, thank you. Much success. Thank you.